Welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan-Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. Okay, on today's episode of the Heal Podcast, I'm so excited to welcome Dr. David Spiegel. Dr. David Spiegel is Wilson Professor and Associate Chair of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Director of the Center on Stress and Health, and Medical Director of the Center for Integrative Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine, where he has been a member of the academic faculty since 1975. He is also a psychiatrist with more than 45 years of clinical and research experience studying stress, pain, sleep, and hypnosis. He has written 13 books, 404 scientific journal articles, and 170 book chapters. He was educated at Harvard and Yale and now works at Stanford. Dr. David Spiegel is also the co-founder and chief scientific officer of new hypnosis app, Reverie. He started Reverie so that you can tap into his expertise change your mind, and improve your life and well-being. Dr. David Spiegel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kelly. Thanks for that nice introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, you get to a point in life where these begin to sound like your memorial speeches. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> but, but I appreciate it. Thank You're you. not there yet. You're not there yet. <laughs> no. Oh my gosh. So you are, you know, the all-knowing expert on hypnosis, especially, which is why um, I, I actually started learning about your work six years ago, right before I was doing heal, because I was so impressed. You were, I felt you were way ahead of the time with your center for integrative medicine at Stanford and, um, using hypnosis to treat, you know, things like pain and trauma and PTSD. And, um, yes. and also I feel like a lot of us, you know, associate with hypnosis of maybe quitting a bad habit, like smoking. So there's so many applications to hypnosis. Right. Let's start by telling us how, um, what got you interested in hypnosis? How did you learn about this modality? Well, Kelly, it's actually sort of a genetic illness in my family. My parents were both psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, and they told me I was free to be any kind of psychiatrist I wanted to be. So here I am. My father uh, got trained in doing hypnosis uh, when he went off to combat in World War II by a Viennese refugee named Gustav von Aschaffenberg, who... Uh, couldn't serve in the army, but had learned about hypnosis because he had a smallpox scar in the middle of his forehead. And as he was doing forensic psychiatry in Austria, and he noticed that when he was interviewing some of these, these prisoners, they would stare at the spot on his head and then just kind of their heads would lean over and they'd be in some kind of a trance. So he got interested in it. Uh, he, he taught my father and his colleagues in the army medical corps, how to use hypnosis. He used it effectively for pain when it Soldiers were injured for post-traumatic uh, stress. He had one soldier who lost the ability to walk after they had been forced to retreat. And uh, he he saw a friend of his down, but he'd been ordered to retreat and he left. And he lost the ability to use his legs. And the my father hypnotized him and uh, said, um, how, what's going on? And he said, I just feel terrible that I left my friend there, that I didn't try to get him out. And my father said, I want you to look at how he's positioned, which way are his feet pointing? And he said, they're pointing down. And so my father said, so he was likely already dead. You, you would have gotten yourself killed and you would not have saved your friend. And the guy started walking again. You know, it was like he was saying, I shouldn't have been able to walk away. Uh. So you know, you see things with hypnosis like that, and you get interested in it. So he did. And he when he came back, he um, was going back to his psychoanalytic training, but uh, and was sort of told give up hypnosis for it gave it up, who are you to use it, you know, and, uh, but he did it anyway. And he found after a while that he was getting better results with hypnosis than four days a week psychoanalysis. And um, he kept he did more and more of that and less and less of psychoanalysis. And so the dinner table conversations were interesting. Um, and but of course, I had to make my own decision about these things. But I took a course uh, at Harvard on hypnosis from Tom Hackett, the chief of psychiatry at Mass General. 
And uh, my first, the first time I ever used it, I'll never forget it. I walked, it, the, the, I was on pediatrics rotation as a medical student. And the nurse says, uh, Spiegel, your next patient's down the hall in room 342. And I'm following the sounds of the wheezing down the hall. And I walk in and there's this uh, attractive young redhead, 15 years old, knuckles white, struggling for breath. Her mother's crying. Um, and I didn't know what else to do. They tried epinephrine uh, uh, under the skin twice, didn't work. They were going to start general anesthesia and put her on steroids. And I didn't know what to do. So I said, would you like to learn a breathing exercise? And she nods. So I get her hypnotized. And then I realized that we hadn't gotten asthma in the course yet. So I came up with something very sophisticated. I said, each breath you take will be a little deeper and a little easier. And within five minutes, she's lying back in bed. She isn't wheezing anymore. Her mother stopped crying. The nurse ran out of the room. My intern comes looking for me, and I figure he's going to pat me on the back and say, good job, Spiegel. What the hell did you do? And um, she, he told me that the nurse had filed a complaint with the nursing supervisor that I had violated Massachusetts law by hypnotizing a minor without parental consent. Yeah. Now, Massachusetts has a lot of weird laws, I'm here to tell you, but that is not on the list. So he said, you got to stop doing it. And I said, why? He said, it might be dangerous. I said, you're about to give her general anesthesia and put her on steroids. And you think this is dangerous. Now she'd been hospitalized every month for three months in status asthmaticus. Um, and I said, tell you what, take me off the case if you want, but as long as she's my patient, I'm not going to tell her something I know isn't true. So over the weekend, there was a council of war with the attending and the superintending and the chief resident. And they came back with a radical idea. They said, let's ask the patient. You know, I don't think that had ever happened before. And she said, oh, I like this. Now, she had one subsequent hospitalization, but went on to study to be a respiratory therapist. And I figured that anything that could help somebody that much, that fast, violate a non-existent Massachusetts law and frustrate the nurse had to be worth looking into, you know. And, and, and you know, and part of it is, Kelly, it was just right before your eyes. You know, you, there were no inferences. There. You just looked at what happened and you knew it. And so since then, I've used hypnosis with about 7,000 people in my career. And most of the time, it is very helpful. And you know right away whether it's going to help them or not. And so I would, you know, that got me started and I, I'm not stopping. Oh, I love that story. And, you know, I want, I, I, I made heal because I understood the power of the mind and, you know, the psychosomatic uh, mechanism and, and just how, how powerful our minds are to harm or heal our bodies, you know, and how intricately connected we are to our minds and our subconscious programming and beliefs. And it seems like hypnosis is kind of um, a way that you can reprogram your subconscious beliefs, you know, and it, it, there's sub. Uh, so I'd love, I'd love for you to kind of go into how it works um, sure. and maybe does it work differently for things like a habit versus a trauma versus um, a phobia Sure. Well, I've been fascinated by that, uh, Kelly, and we've done uh, a series of functional magnetic resonance imaging studies of what happens in the brain and PET studies when you use hypnosis. And what it is, is a narrowing of the focus of attention. It's been called believed in imagination. It's, it's, it's um, like the experience you get if you're watching a good movie. You get so caught up. Do you ever get so caught up in the movie that you kind of forget you're watching a movie and enter the imagined world? Yes. And later on, you might think, well, that part didn't make so much sense. But at the time, you're just in the story, not in the theater, if you know what I mean. Yes. That's what hypnosis is like. To do that, to focus attention that much, like looking through the telephoto lens of a camera, you need to be able to dissociate, to put outside of conscious awareness things that would ordinarily be in consciousness, not worry about what else you should be doing or where you have to go for lunch or whatever it is. You keep your focus on the center of your attention. And the third thing is, is what used to be called suggestibility, but is really cognitive flexibility. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what scares everybody about hypnosis, you know, lousy movies like Get Out, you know, with a spoon on the teacup and, you know, all this stuff <laughs> scares people. It, you know, if you're worried about susceptibility to other human input, you know, that's not a hypnosis problem. That's a bigger problem than that. You know, 70% of Republicans think that Trump won the election. You know, we, we are susceptible of social influence. But what you do in hypnosis is when you focus intently, you let go of old predispositions, presumptions, assumptions about yourself or what people will think about you. 
you're in a state where you're more open to trying new and different things. Now, you know, when stage hypnotists, you know, make the football coach dance like a ballerina or something that it, it, they make fun of people. I don't like it. I don't like the reputation it gives, but it is an illustration of the power of just letting go of your usual assumptions of who you are and what you would ordinarily do and trying something else. That is a great framework for psychotherapeutic change. You're focused intently, you're putting outside distractions away, and you're open to trying things differently than you usually do. That's a great time to learn and change. And that's why hypnosis is such a powerful platform for helping people. And I just wish people could see more of the potential advantages of which there are plenty and not the potential disadvantages. Any treatment has its risks and benefits, but with hypnosis, the benefits vastly outweigh the risks. I mean, what risks are there? I don't see any any harmful side effect possibilities. That, that's that's exactly right. The, the worst thing that happens with hypnosis is sometimes it doesn't work. Fine. You yeah. know, that, that's absolutely right. It's 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 a real it's an opportunity to try being different, see what it feels like, and then fill that in with changing the way you practice and what you do. So it can be very helpful. Um, and, and we do use it differently. That is, there are different approaches that we use in reverie for pain or for sleep or, or for stress management or to stop smoking. And I'll be glad to discuss what those are. So there are different ways in which we use it. But it is a state uh, that you would hope somebody who wants to change and get better is in. Highly focused, putting aside distractions and uh, open to new possibilities. And we actually understand how that works in the brain now. With functional imaging, we've shown that when you're in hypnosis, you turn down activity in the anterior cingulate cortex. It's a We have like part of the brain is sort of an inverted C, and the front part of it, right in the middle of the brain, uh, is part of the salience network. It's a part of the brain that tells you, look out. If you hear a loud noise and you're worried if it's a gunshot, the salience network is firing off and say, you better pay attention to this. It's what social media uses to track you away from something else you're doing by floating a threat by or something like that. You turn that down activity in that part of your brain. You turn up activity in, in the connection between your executive control region, the prefrontal cortex, and the insula, which is a very important little part of the brain, a little island in the brain that conveys information to the body and receives information from the body. So it's a mind-body connection. And hypnosis is very effective in controlling mind-body activity. We did one study where we hypnotized people and had them eat imaginary meals. And we were, it was early in the morning. You couldn't have had breakfast before. Um, they would take, you know, uh, uh, you know, eat at the best restaurants they could think of for an hour. Uh, I was getting hungry just listening to them. And okay. one woman after a half an hour said, let's stop, I'm full. <laughs> just, yeah. We got an 89% increase. We measured their gastric acid secretion, 89% increase in gastric acid secretion, imaginary meals. We then had them do something relaxing that didn't, uh, require food, involve food, and they got a 39% decrease in gastric acid secretion. And even when we injected them with pentagastrin, which stimulates gastric acid secretion, we got a 19% reduction when they weren't thinking about food. So the, the mind-body connection is intensified in hypnosis. And the third thing is that you, you turn down when you're thinking about things, the relationship between your prefrontal cortex the executive control region, and the posterior cingulate. That's the back part of the cingulate. And that's involved in self-reflection and wondering about yourself, who you are, what you are, what people. It's a part of the brain where activity is reduced in experienced meditators too. You know, you're supposed to get over yourself in meditation. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that hypnosis is Western. It's there to solve a problem. I'm not trying to make a bunch of people walk around hypnotized. I'm trying to help them use it to deal with pain or stress or anxiety or uh, insomnia or ha bad habits. And so it's, it's Western, it's for a purpose. But you also can, during hypnosis, reduce activity in that part of the brain as well. So you're letting go of yourself in the way you usually are, you're focusing intently, and you're turning off distractions, you're dissociating. And so um, I want to talk about hypnotizability, but is it like, you know, my, my friend used your app, um, and which is why we're reconnected today. And she, Great. 
quit, you know, she's, she's European. She's, she's the health nut, but she smoked cigarettes, you know, it's like her yeah. own vice or whatever, like right. many, my European friends do. And, um, she used one time, one, one hypnosis on your app and she loves your, you know, your calm, gent, you know, gentle voice of authority. And she said she hasn't picked up a cigarette since, you know, Love it. so it's, I mean, it's obviously very effective and you've treated 7,000 people with different things. Um, but is it, you know, is it one and done based on your hypnotizability? Is it like, is, are you, or do you need to do it a few times based on the depth of the trauma, depending on what you're doing? Like, are you creating new neural pathways or are you just reprogramming the software? Like, or it does it vary? Well, it can vary. And certainly some problems like trauma often require more than just one treatment, but Sometimes if you're willing to let go of your old presuppositions and you take an approach that is intrinsically self-reinforcing, Kelly, that makes a difference. So what Amanda learned uh, in using the app um, was um, not to say don't smoke. You know, we, we people who use hypnosis kid each other and saying the worst thing you can tell someone is don't think about purple elephants. Right. You know, what are you going to think about? Right. Yeah. So. And I can remember driving along the highway and seeing signs that said, are you dying for a smoke? And, you know, very clever, but people would say, yeah, I am. And they would light up, you know, that you don't tell people what not to do. You tell them what to do. You focus on what you're for. So what she was taught to do is to focus on three things. For my body, smoking is a poison. I need my body to live. I owe my body respect and protection. So, and I get them to think about in hypnosis, think of your body as if it were your baby. Would you ever put tar and nicotine into the lungs of your baby or your cat, you know, any a, a pet that you cared about? Of course not. Well, you know what? Your body is as dependent on you as your baby or your pet. Mm. It has to deal with whatever you put into it. And so many smokers kid themselves by saying, well, I'm just doing it to myself. Well, yeah, you are, but you can stop doing it to yourself, but your body may have suffered so much damage that it's not going to recover. So think of yourself in this position of respecting and protecting your body. Focus on what you're for. And what this means is, yeah, you have an urge. You don't have an urge. Nobody has ever died in nicotine withdrawal. It's it's addictive, but it's not that addictive. Other drugs are more dangerously addictive. Um, but you can feel good from the moment you make that commitment. You say, it's not that I'm depriving myself of anything. It's that I am making a commitment to respect and protect my body. And you can feel good about that. And that's why there are these people that, that say one and done. I had this wonderful uh, person lives in San Francisco, was in one of our early studies. And she didn't even want to stop smoking. She said, I smoked for 25 years. What the hell? You know, I don't care. And she tried the exercise once and sort of didn't like it. But she went home that night and tried it again. And she lit up a cigarette and said, Feh, who needs this? And she put it out. She hasn't had a cigarette since. And she wrote, she's getting her friends to stop smoking. <laughs> and she wrote, she wrote to me, um, you know, this is some kind of crazy ass voodoo shit. And <laughs> I mean that in a good way. <laughs> so if you if you combine the intensity of focus, the willingness to disconnect from your usual way of thinking about things, um, you can make a big change in a short time. Wow. That's even if you don't want to, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, you, you, you ally with, you know, we're, we're complex creatures, you know, yeah. and so it's, you want to or not, that's always a kind of compromise. And so what we got her to do is to ally with the part of herself. You're right. That she consciously didn't want to, but some part of her was saying, I'm harming my body and I can feel it. And, uh, you know, I'm not breathing the same way I was 20 years ago. Um, and so you could ally with the parts of her that knew there was trouble and wanted to pile on and make a difference. Mm, I love that. So that brings us to hypnotizability. Um, I know that that affects probably the outcome. And, and how do you how do you determine if people are hypnotizable or not? What kind of percentage mm -hmm. of the population? And is that something that you can strengthen so that this modality could work for you if you're not generally hypnotizable? Well, hypnotizability is a very stable trait. Um, while it, when most kids, most eight-year-olds are in trances most of the time, you know, they're <laughs> they're off doing their thing, work and play are all the same thing. It's a shame that we try to make them into little adults because childhood is so cool. 
But as we go through adolescence, we tend to develop what we call formal operations. That is, you, you value reason over experience to some extent. And so some of us lose that ability to just get lost in our imagination. Um, by the time you're 21, your hypnotizability is as stable a trait as IQ. It just doesn't change very much. About uh, three quarters of the adult population is at least somewhat hypnotizable. About 15% is very hypnotizable. And a quarter to a third are just not. But um, what we do, Kelly, is trance and treatment. So it helps if you can easily slip into the trance. It may feel more effortless to you the way your friend Amanda felt when she did it. Um, but it is possible to use the approach, the treatment part, the way we approach a problem to get benefit, even if you're not that hypnotizable. So it's the combination that works and you can combine them in, in different ways. We now on, on the Reverie app, um, which people can download from either the app store if they have an iOS phone or from uh, Google Play if they have an Android, um, we have a five minute hypnotizability test. So it's a, it's a brief uh, entry into the hypnotic state with some instructions and we see how you respond to the instructions and it helps you to just sort of understand what your level of hypnotizability is most people are at least somewhat hypnotizable and it's the it's the sort of balance between just feeling your way into it and just flowing along down the river with it or whether you need to structure your experience a little more practice a little more carefully and you can still benefit but you do in a slightly different way great that's amazing um, so let's talk, we kind of touched on the habit with the smoking example. I know mm. you do a lot with pain and mm. it, I mean, pain, I know a lot of people are dealing with chronic pain. Um, obviously we have an opioid cr crisis, which mm. is something we want to, um, pull away from. So talk to us about the power of hypnosis for pain and where mm. you're seeing it in hospitals and, and, and work that you've done and, and why we're not seeing it more. Uh, the strain and pain lies mainly in the brain, Kelly. Um, you know, we have signals that come in from the periphery, but the brain decides what those signals mean. And um, uh, I think one reason we have the ability to modulate pain with hypnosis is that, you know, predators detect movement. And back in prehistory, we were, we're not very big. We're not very strong. We don't run that fast. One way we had to preserve ourselves if we were injured was to pretend we were dead, to just not move because predators look for movement. And so we have a tremendous ability in our brain to, to reprocess pain signals. Mm. Now, right now, you and your listeners you know, are probably mostly sitting in a chair. And until I mention it, hopefully, you weren't aware of the sensations in your body. There. If you were, we can just stop now. Um, but... Uh, um, we're very good at filtering in or out in sensation. Uh, women have given birth throughout human prehistory and history without anesthesia and epidural blocks and all that stuff. Um, we can, you know, there's sort of good pain and bad pain. There's pain you need to know something about if you just broke your ankle um, to, to get help. Or if you're having crushing substernal chest pain, get to an ER, don't treat the pain. You may be having a heart attack. On the other hand, uh, a lot of time we treat chronic pain as if it were acute pain. You know, you know that you hurt your arm three weeks ago and it's getting better and, you know, there's no point paying attention to it. So our brain is very good at, at uh, modulating the pain we experience. And in hypnosis, you can substantially alter and sometimes even eliminate uh, the perception of pain. I do it not by saying the pain will go away, but rather... Imagine your 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 arm that hurts is in uh, an icy mountain stream, feeling a sense of cool, tingling numbness, filter the hurt out of the pain. Um, and we found that, and other investigators have that you actually turn down activity in the somatosensory cortex here, where we process pain signals and other sensory signals. If you tell people in hypnosis, well, let's try it a different way. The pain is there, but it, it won't bother you that much because you know what it is. You know it's getting better. Um, don't worry about it. Um, the the You get analgesia then, but it's in the anterior cingulate cortex. You turn down activity there. So it's, you turn down your worry center. Because, you know, many of my cancer patients have found that, you know, they get a new chest pain. They think, oh, my God, it's a new metastasis. You know, the cancer spreading. And 
we did a randomized trial with women with metastatic breast cancer, taught them this kind of self-hypnosis exercise once a week to practice at the end of a support group. And by the end of the year, they had half the pain that control group did on the same and very low amounts of medication. So it works not just acutely, but it works chronically too. Because they would say, if I feel, start to feel the pain, I do my self-hypnosis and I felt better. You know, I just filtered the hurt out of the pain. So we know it works. We know that within a tenth of a second, the pain signals coming to the brain um, are reduced substantially when people are hypnotized. You just tell them cool, tingling, and numb. So it's not that you're later thinking, well, it wasn't that bad. It's that you're changing your brain's processing of the pain signals so that you feel less pain. And when you feel less pain, you most likely will heal faster because you're not in resistance, rigidity, or stress, right? Well, certainly that can be true, that you can allow your body to do its normal healing process without, you know, you immobilize a limb and uh, you get muscle wasting and um, it, it's harder to get it moving again. Uh, so certainly if you can use it appropriately without doing further harm, uh, it, it may heal more quickly, yes. Now mental pain, depression, what have you seen with hypnosis and depression? Uh, it, 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 there are studies that show that it can be helpful with depression um, it, it, to the extent that you can let go of your old assumptions, that the, the, the views of, of who you are. And with depressed people, um, you know, you tell a depressed person nine good things about themselves and one bad thing, and what they remember is the bad thing. So if you can just kind of disconnect from your usual customary assumptions about yourself, that can sometimes lighten the depression and allow you to take in positive feedback that you otherwise would, would kind of filter mm -hmm. out. You know, it's sort of the converse of pain where you, you want to filter out the perception. Here you want to filter in the perception of, of things that might make you feel better. Um, there's so there is some evidence uh, that uh, hypnosis can be helpful. There's a psychologist, Michael Yapko, who's written some very good books on hypnosis for depression. Uh, it's very useful for for anxiety. Um, it's uh, uh, can help, and and the way we treat anxiety is from the body up. That is normally, you know, we think of psychotherapy as top down. You know, fix it in the brain first, and the body will follow. With anxiety. We, you know, the way we often get anxious is you worry about something and then your body reacts to that. Your muscles tighten, you start to sweat, you know, you breathe more rapidly. And then, and then you notice that you think, oh my God, this is really bad. And then you get more anxious. Sometimes, and yeah. body reacts. So it's like a snowball rolling downhill. So we start from the bottom up, from the body up. So I have people imagine they're floating in a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or floating in space. Um, and just affiliate with the sense of physical comfort you get. Now, you still haven't done anything about what's worrying you, but you've already done something about the effect that the worry has on you. So you're beginning to control part of it. And then you can picture, for example, on an imaginary screen, something that's worrying you on one side of the screen and something you could do about it on the other. It doesn't mean the best or the only thing you could do, but just being in this more active position um, can often help you feel better. And uh, that's beginning, that, and that can be a very effective way of, of treating, uh, treating anxiety. So you wouldn't uh, picture the thing that you're worried about happening a different way. You would picture more empowerment of something that you could do about it. Yeah, I know you, you could. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. You, well, yeah, you I mean, know. there's just, there's so much that, you, you know, playing with imagination and, and imagining, you know, the icy, so I, I just I was curious at why you were empowering the the patient rather than um, kind of diving them into a new visualization. I know that like in hypnosis with trauma, there's often a reframe like, yeah. uh, you know, the, the feet were face down. He was you most likely had the best outcome by walking away. You saved yourself. It, it was it was a helpless situation kind of thing. Yes, um, that's true. Um, and and that's can be more complex. I had a uh, a lovely woman who who comes from a country that is not famous for treating women well. and she uh, had gotten out finally to the United States and became a healthcare professional, but she retired early, was chronically depressed, kind of miserable. And I asked her about that early period, and she said, well, 
when I was 12 years old, I was raped by our landlord and my parents were afraid to do anything about it. They were afraid we'd be thrown out. And I began to realize as I walked around the streets that my body wasn't my own. Men could do or say anything they wanted, you know, and so she was chronically demoralized and she was very hypnotizable. And I had, I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to picture yourself as that 12 year old girl and kind of imagine you're your own mother. Um, and she starts to cry. And I said, I want you to picture her right after she was assaulted. And I said, is this her fault? And she shook her head. She said, no, no, she's a sweet, innocent girl. Uh, but many, many sexual assault survivors blame themselves for things they didn't control. We'd often rather feel guilty than helpless. And so inappropriate guilt is one of the things that keeps people trapped in, in mm -hmm. their reliving of the trauma. So uh, I said, well, what would you do if you were her mother? And she started crying again. She said, I'm stroking her hair. I'm stroking her hair. She's such a sweet little girl. And she came out of it. She said she felt different. She felt better somehow. And she called me a week later and said, uh, Dr. Spiegel, my psychiatrist wants to know what you did to me because I'm not depressed anymore. And my friends don't recognize me. Um, they say, you're so happy. And so there are times when you can use it to just uh, re reappraise, reset, and re-understand something that happened to you that has been causing chronic pain and help people deal with it better. So, uh, and again, it's this state of intense focus. She wasn't just remembering it. She was reliving that experience, but was able to see it from a different point of view. And it made a big difference to her. That's beautiful life-saving it's really like liberating um yeah. we have so many prisons in our mind and loops and you know stuckness so this is such a Good. beautiful beautiful um modality and and then let's just touch real quickly on phobias thank you for tolerating sure. me as i'm just but i just think if, no, if sure, people sure. hear how it could help them with their specific thing i know people with phobias of getting on an airplane. Right. Um, I have some sort of claustrophobia if I'm in a room that feels stagnant or if I feel that someone's on top of me and I can't, I can't like get fresh air. I, it must be like some past life trauma or something. Cause I don't know where it came from, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it might be too woo woo for you, but, no. um, but talk to me a little no. bit about phobia and how that, how that approach kind of differs. Uh, well, we, um, uh, you know, try to get people to, first of all, again, control the body. So, because part of what happens with a phobia is you confront the phobic situation. And the worst thing you can do with a phobia is avoid what you're afraid of, because two things happen. Number one, you're giving yourself a message that 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 dog or that bridge or whatever it is, or that airplane is really dangerous because I'm staying away from it. I mean, it's a kind of reverse logic, but that's how, you know, the brain is assessing your experience and saying, well, it must be bad because she's not going there. Um, and the other thing is you don't build up a reservoir of positive associations. So, you know, the view from the top of that building was really beautiful. Like, oh, I wasn't thinking about falling off it. Um, or the dog actually was kind of nice or, you know, who knows. Uh, I'll tell you a story. My, my father was treating a social worker in New York um, who had a terrible dog phobia. She would plan her leaving the apartment for times when she thought people wouldn't be out walking their dogs. And in midtown Manhattan, that's not it's easy. Never. It's never. <laughs> and she would just freak out. And she she got so upset at a big fancy dinner her, her father, her, her husband had arranged that she knocked over the table and there was food everywhere. And he said, you've got to get fixed. I can't stand this. Oh. So my father hypnotized her and had her say, um, um, picture um a dog as uh as potentially a friend that there are dangers there are wild animals and tame animals and you make a decision whether this is one a wild type or a, or a tame type and and have a friend who you trust who has a dog bring it over and hold it and then go up and touch have an experience of actually touching the dog and she petted the dog finally and said dog friend dog friend and so she said thanks she felt much better and about six months later, my father called for a follow-up. He was unusual at that time and doing follow-ups on his patients. And a boy answered the phone and he said, well, is, is your mommy there? 
And he said, um, uh, can I say who's calling? And um, he said, uh, Dr. Spiegel. And the boy said, well, that's funny. And my father said, what's funny? And the boy said, Spiegel's in heat. <laughs> <laughs> got a dog named Spiegel. They got a dog named Spiegel. They talk about transference. You know, that's... Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Oh, my goodness. So, so what you do is you get people to... Um, restructure their understanding of the situation, controlling how their body is reacting first. So we have a new app out on Reverie now uh, to deal with flying phobia. And there are three things I ask people to do. One, float with the plane. Don't fight the plane. People get in the plane. And like you said about being inside a, you know, a closed space. And the more you fight it, the more constraining it feels, you know, and you've got a seatbelt on and all that. Instead, float with the plane. So just let your body do have the wisdom first. Your body is just floating with the plane, enjoying the feeling, not feeling constrained. And the second thing is think of the plane as an extension of your body. You know, if you want to get from one place to another, you can walk. If you want to get there faster, you take a maybe a bicycle. It's an extension of your body. So is a car. So is an airplane. It lets you do what you want to do, but better. The pilot it is basically your choice. You chose an airline that trains pilots well. So the pilot is an extension of your brain controlling the vehicle, the plane, which is an extension of your body. So you're not feeling trapped and helpless now. You're feeling in control. And then the third thing is you think of the difference between a possibility and a probability. It's always possible the plane could fall out of the sky. It's always possible this building could collapse on top of us, but it isn't probable. So the fact that you can vividly picture it doesn't mean it's likely to happen. Mm. So you just have people practice that before as they're getting ready for the flight. When they get on the plane, buckle your seatbelt and go through those three steps. And we get emails from around the world from people who got there. That's awesome. Yeah, I know I have a friend who's had a traumatic experience on a private jet and now takes a hops on a tanker to go to Hawaii. So it's a three week journey just to get to Hawaii because he's so traumatized. So I'm yeah. definitely going to send him your app. Good. please. Uh -huh. Real quick before um, I indulge in a, in a little hypnosis session with you um, so people can kind of have the experience and, and if they're watching it on YouTube, see um, how it works. Cause I know there's some body movements that you walk me through. Right. Um, I, I'm, we talk about it in heal the, this nocebo effect of, um, and the suggestibility of a patient in the presence of an authority figure, like a doctor, you know, and then they're in a state of fear. So they're hyper-focused, like you said, on what the, the language of the doctor is, you know, and then they could buy into, um, the prognosis that tends to be negative and, and kind of an average, which then perpetuates the average, um, so is that kind of a state of hypnosis where a, a, a patient can be under, you know, this, whatever the doctor says then becomes a reality in the person's body experience? If that well, I would, I would say, um, it, it's not always that straightforward, but I would say the, the emotional tone and the relationship tone will influence your experience of whatever it is that's happening. So, you know, if you see, you know, the white coat effect can be good or bad, you know, on the one hand, um, you know, seeing uh, a doctor that you like and who wants to help you and you feel in good hands with that doctor, you're kind of, you'll, you'll let your guard down, you'll relax your muscles, you'll lower your heart rate and blood pressure, and you'll let it happen. Um, if you're feeling like you're struggling or you're in danger or the doctor's going to do something something that's unpleasant or hurtful or unnecessary, uh, you'll get tense. You'll have the the opposite reaction and you'll be fighting the treatment instead of participating in it. Mm -hmm. So it's important that you feel that you trust. And, it, you know, there is literature on the white coat effect on blood pressure. You know, if you're anxious when they're measuring it, your blood pressure will be higher. And if you're relaxed and comfortable, it'll be lower. So um, I think the idea here is for you to feel, to reassure yourself that you're doing the right thing, that you've chosen a doctor who knows what they're doing and can really help you and is there to help you. And you can welcome and participate in it mentally rather than fight it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you find a doctor that maybe their bedside manner is not aligned with you or you're finding yourself in that stress response, you know, maybe it's, it's just mm -hmm. not the right doctor for you. You want a doctor that believes in what they're doing, can help you, has a 
attitude and a, and a way of expressing that, you know, encourages you to your belief in your kind of um, confidence in the treatment. Right. Exactly. You want a partner. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Um, okay. So real quick, because I want people to have like an experience and, and your, your, the, the hypnosis on, on your app are about eight to 10 minutes long. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Okay. So yeah. I'll just, I thought of this last night and, and you're, you're willing to um, do this with me, which I'm so sure. grateful, but sure. I'm going through, um, I, I decided to freeze my eggs because I just, you know, I'm approaching my mid forties and like, well, you know, I have a beautiful daughter and uh, just, you know, it's just one of those things you want to just do it just in case you never know what the future holds. So it's kind of my last hurrah. Um, so there's a, and, and I'm in that point where they're going to trigger me today. And in two days, they're going to retrieve the eggs. So there's a little bit of anxiety that's coming up and obviously stress is um, counterproductive to having our eggs thrive and, you know, be uh, good quality and, and, and flourishing. Um, so there's anxiety about not only the procedure itself, because I don't love going under general anesthesia and also, um, or whatever it's like anesthesia, but, um, and also the outcome, because you don't know when, when you go under what the outcome is going to be. So, and I'm not, you know, I'm a little bit of a geriatric fertility age. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. so I would love for you to guide me through some sort of hypnosis that kind of helps with that anxiety and, and potentially sure. improves the body. Good. Okay. Correct. Let's see. Let's see what we can do. Okay. So get as comfortable as you can. On one, do one thing, look up, all the way up, high as you can. Keep your head still, that's good, way up. And as you look up, slowly close your eyes. Close, close, take a deep breath. Let the breath out slowly, slowly. Good. One more deep breath. Hold halfway. Now fill your lungs completely. And slowly exhale. Okay. And just let your body float. Imagine you're floating in a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or just floating in space. And then let one hand or the other float up in the air like a balloon. And that'll be your signal to yourself that you're ready to concentrate. I want you to imagine that even if I ask you to pull your right hand down with your left hand, it'll float right back up to the upright position. You'll find something pleasant and amusing about this sensation. Now, please try it now. Let your left hand float over, pull your right hand down, and then let go. What does that feel like? Kind of light. Feels light. Good. Each breath deeper and easier. Body floating safe and comfortable. Now notice how quickly and easily you can use your imagination and your store of memories to help yourself and your body feel better. Please imagine now that you're somewhere that you feel safe and comfortable floating in a bath, a lake, a hot tub, floating in space. Please describe how your body's feeling. Relax. Good. Warm. Where do you picture your body being? Lying on a paddleboard in Maui. Great. In the ocean. Terrific. So you can smell the air, feel the ocean breeze, Gently rocking. What does it feel like now? That's very relaxing, peaceful. Good. So now you're using your store of memories to help yourself and help your body. And I want you to picture on an imaginary screen an image that conveys to you what it is you want to do in stimulating and then retrieving your eggs.
What do you see? Um, I see like an ultrasound of my ovaries mm -hmm. and they're all, the follicles are all 18 millimeter diameter or bigger or whatever mm -hmm. the measurement's supposed to be for mature eggs. Mm -hmm. And... And then I picture coming out of the surgery and my doctor smiling with like surprised eyes of great outcome. Great. I'd like you to picture something else. Imagine you could have seen the ultrasound of your ovaries creating the life of your daughter. What does that look like to you? I can see you smiling. <laughs> um, yeah, so just an ultrasound of like my daughter as an egg, you think mm -hmm. like that. And then growing into a fetus and a baby. Yeah, it feels very like heart expanding, warm. Yeah. Miraculous, awe-inspiring. It is. And it's your body that did it. So revisit the pleasure that comes with recognizing that this is something that your own body, your body has already done. It's created an egg that gave life to your daughter. So it can do it again. Mm. How are you feeling now? I feel very good. Good. I'm very confident. Good. And just like kind of proud and in partnership with my body. Yes, in partnership with your body. So you're feeling proud of your body. Yes. So you're giving it another opportunity to do something that will make you proud again. Mm. And you can reassure yourself that your body will do its best. And your doctor is going to help your body do that. How are you feeling now? Grateful. Good. All right, now, this is an exercise you can practice anytime you want to prepare for the procedure or anytime you have any concerns about it. Don't fight it, admit it, sit down or lie down, go into the state of self-hypnosis and re-experience your feeling of hope and pleasure for your body doing again what it has already done. Now take a few moments to reflect on what this means to you in a private sense. And then we'll come out of the state of self-hypnosis by counting backwards from three to one. On three, you'll get ready. On two, with your eyelids closed, you'll roll up your eyes. One, you'll let them open. You'll let your hand float back down, feel normal again. Make a fist open, and that'll be the end of the exercise. Ready? Three, two, with your eyelids closed, roll up your eyes. One, let your eyes open. Hand float back down, make a fist open, and that'll be the end of the exercise. Wow. How are you feeling? I feel good. I feel obviously there's no anxiety. Um, right. I feel very at peace. Good. And it was just like a reconnection, integration of like harmony in my body mind right. rather than this disjointed thing that happens with fear and anxiety. Exactly. Exactly. That's just what I was hoping for. That's great. Thank you. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. Ah, <sighs> okay. Well, just once again, Reverie app it can help so many people with so many things. I encourage everybody to check it out. You can download it from the 
Apple Store if you have a if you have an iPhone and uh, the Google Play Store if you're if you're an Android. Right. And what else? What else can you tell us? Um, well, we that? we have uh, we have apps you can measure your hypnotizability to deal with anxiety, stress, focus, focusing your mind more, um, flying phobias, uh, dealing with problems like eating, uh, smoking or eating, learning to eat more healthily, um, problems with uh, controlling alcohol use too. Um, and um, there are both a brief one minute reinforcement sessions. And also, as you mentioned, the eight to 12 minute hypnosis sessions it's interactive so i ask you a question you give me an answer and then the next instruction changes to depend on um what you've said before um we were getting fewer feedback responses about the sleep app although it was the, the second most commonly used one other than pain control and we found out the reason was that people at the end of the sleep experience just wanted to go to sleep they didn't want to tell us how sleepy they were, <laughs> they were asleep they, they were, were asleep so uh, um, we hope that people will find it useful. The first seven days are free, and then you can decide if you want. You can try it, see how it feels, and uh, sign sign on for a month or a year or a lifetime uh, membership. But Reverie is there to help uh, your listeners do to do like what you did, Kelly, to kind of re reprogram your mind body relationship. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming on and. You're welcome. Sharing, sharing about what you do and 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 just all the ways that hypnosis can help people heal really and and that's, liberate themselves. That's a great way to put it. That's exactly right. You're gaining control. Uh, and uh, I wish you the best. Please let me know what happens with the. Uh, I will. With your, good. good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, You're most welcome. Bye have bye. a wonderful day. Thank you. you Thank too. you. Bye now. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gore. Thank you so much and be well.